Good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome to our second session of today, which is about aligning associations. And it is a great pleasure for me, I am Marit Bromar, Executive Director of the IGA, to have three people with me in this session, in which we're going to talk about how best to serve our membership across that energy space from the three different organizations. Ladies first, so I start with Edith Wilson today, all the way from the USA, representing AAPG. We have Marcel van Loon, Executive Director of the EAGE, based in the Netherlands. And we have Alexander Richter, President, until this weekend, of the IGA, based in Reykjavik. Edith, can I ask you for a short introduction who you are and what it is that you do on behalf of the AAPG? Thank you, Merit. It's, I'm uh, delighted to be here joining you all today. Thank you all for calling in. I'm Edith Wilson. I am a 30-year oil and gas geologist turned renewable energy resource consultant. So for the last four years, my small firm in Tulsa, Oklahoma, has been working to engage energy geoscientists in energy solutions for a changing world. So thank you for having me, Merit. I'll let your next panelist introduce himself. Excellent. Marcel, can I then turn to you and ask for a short introduction? Yes, of course, yeah. I'm Marcel Valoon, I'm the um, executive director of the EAG. I work for um, 20 years with the, um, with the EAG now, and probably this is the most challenging time I need to steer the um, organization through. We have quite some offices around the world. We have an office in the Netherlands, which is the head office, office in Dubai, Kuala Lumpur, Bogota, um, and Moscow. So it's, it is, as I said, the most challenging time of the EAG um, because this is a combination crisis, as we can see. So um, I'm happy to participate. Excellent. Thank you. And Alex, IGA president. Yeah, so very briefly, so I'm Alexander Richter. I'm the elected president of the IGA um, until, well, this weekend, this upcoming weekend. Um, uh, and in that, that sense, uh, uh, yeah, um, running a geothermal news platform, Think Geoenergy, and I uh, recently just uh, joined the Iceland Renewable Energy Cluster as its executive director. So in a way, kind of moving again, closer to managing an association in that, in that sense. Yes. So, uh, a lot of the learnings from the IGA and, uh, and others uh, coming together once again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, all three of you, for your time and your dedication, not only to be here today, but also on behalf of all of our memberships, because I do think, you know, as an executive director myself of the IGA, um, it is vital that we serve our membership across the globe for everything related to uh, to energy. Marcel, I'm going to start with you because you pointed, you know, you triggered the conversation towards having to steer an organization in a very difficult time. I'm assuming you referred to COVID-19 and these extreme circumstances that we're currently in. Um, could I ask you, you know, to highlight a few things that how, how is the EAGE dealing with this and how are you adapting towards these extreme circumstances? Yeah, if I, if I look at EAG, uh, thanks for asking. It's, um, so it is double challenging as, as for all of us because COVID, you have COVID-19 and, and as, you, as we all noticed, the, um, the oil price has dropped to um, a, dramatic, uh, a dramatic price for the whole industry. So that means we have two uncertain factors in our, um, in our, in our, in our history and our way forward. And, um, and of course, the, um, the drop of um, events, the, the EAG was fairly centered around, um, of course, around publications, but we were quite strong in organizing events, smaller and bigger events around the whole world. So this is basically what we miss now, the contact with the people in regions and, and in bigger events, our own annual was uh, in, in, in danger at a certain moment in, 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 and still in danger, but quite in danger at a certain moment in time. So the lockdown of all sort of countries and the travel restrictions have challenged our work quite a lot. And, and, and this is what we try to establish with, um, with um, I, I would say, speeded up 
development of online activities like um, short courses, webinars, community meetings, and all sort of things. We try to find ways to to engage with our members, and we try to speed up um, the the diversification of our topics, which was there was a multidisciplinary uh, society already, and we are a multidisciplinary meeting uh, society, but now it's more the time to actually search that diversification um, for members even more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll come to diversification indeed in, in a sec. And AAPP, yeah. I mean, based in based in the USA, your headquarters, Edith, is in uh, is in the US, uh, you're, 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 but you're, you also see a membership across the globe. How are you coping? You know, under these extreme circumstances, what's the adaptation strategy for the AAPG? Thank you, Merritt. Um, as uh, I neglected to mention in my introduction, I am the um, uh, president of the Energy Minerals Division of the AAPG, which is our division that deals with all things ex petroleum, other energy related um, uh, minerals and resources. So we were in this week planning our annual conference for the organization as a whole, which was to be held in Houston. So we have spent the last two months really re-examining how we um, aggregate our members and how we communicate our, um, our technology and create networking opportunities. And what I think I will say um, regarding the AAPG as a whole is that we are now planning nothing. <laughs> Everything that we are planning point forward has a virtual element. We are, we are no longer excluding the virtual element from any of our planning. Um, the other um, uh, piece that I will say is from a more personal level, I think that as all of us have experienced staying at home and staying in isolation, we are going to make different choices about how we elect to communicate in person in the future. For myself and for I think many other members of technical organizations, we will no longer travel to Amsterdam or London for three days of indoor meetings of lectures. That's something we can share virtually but we may congregate for joint exhibits of new technology, for field work, for field tours, for um, networking opportunities and collaborative sessions. We'll be very critical and particular about how we add, um, allocate value to interpersonal uh, uh, meetings. And, um, and, and I think that's a good thing because we have been facing as a, an industry of professional associations an over meeting, uh, an overlap of too many meetings, too much time and resources, both personal and business, on meetings. So now we have an opportunity to really restructure that and put that in person connection where it has the most value. Great, thank you. And, and Alex, I mean, on behalf of the IGA, we have been discussing this intimately, of course, over the past, uh, well, let's say months because we were forced to postpone, for instance, our flagship uh, event, the World Geothermal Conference 2020. So in your opinion, how, how, how do we adapt and what is, I mean, let's be honest, we're facing a virtual board meeting for the first time ever with the IGA, a handover, you're handing over your presidency virtually to the incoming president. This is unique in that matter. What is your observations on this adaptation of the IGA? It's twofold. I mean, what was really interesting, both from Marcel and, and Edith, is to <clears throat> to essentially kind of there, there are two there are two things. Number one is naturally we we've been traveling way too much for things that are maybe not absolutely necessary. I I totally agree on that. Uh, I mean, how many conferences I have gone to, and it's like oh, what a waste of time until you had that one meeting, and that meeting made it worth it. It's just the question: Do you really need to travel thousands of miles? Uh, for a meeting like that. That is that is the big question. Uh, but you will never know until you have that meeting. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky thing. Um, on the other hand is the, the notion of the personal interaction. And you can sense this in the, all the online meetings that we have these days is that people are missing this interpersonal interaction. 
Yeah. So I see this now. I mean, Iceland is opening up uh, already and we have the first big meetings here still with some kind of distancing, but we have normal meetings again. And people flock to these meetings because they just missed it so much. Um, I mean, they probably kind of will, they won't miss it so that much after a short while, but, but for, for now it's, it's, it's inc incredible to see that how people kind of were looking for that personal interaction. So we will definitely see a big change in that regard. And on the other hand, I mean, and this is, this is the more fundamental part for organizations like the IGA and EAGE as well. I guess it's the business element. We, we probably don't admit as much as we maybe should is that part of holding events have been a way of financing our organizations. Uh, how much of that is useful or necessary is another question, but it has been a crucial element of our income. So not being able to hold those events is, is tricky. I mean, and I personally, I mean, I've outside of the IG, you know, been living on holding events as well. And that is, and, and I see this now. I mean, if I were dependent on that, it would change my livelihood quite a bit. Fortunately, I'm not depending on this anymore, but that is a big challenge. So how do we change our business operandi kind of not having these events that allow us in the engagement with our members, uh, with the paying people, with the participants that are paid to attend these events and the value that we provide with these events, it's challenging. And what we see now is that all these webinars popping up uh, and it's a lot of free value all of a sudden out there. Yeah. Where do you put a value to it to, to, to make sure that this is still paying for your efforts to doing that? Mm -hmm. And we see this now and there will be a complete change. And I totally agree how that will look like time will tell. Because I, 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 I echo that. And, and, and Marcel, uh, just before we, we went online, we were saying that you postponed the annual, so the EAG always have an annual event, a yearly event. Uh, you postponed until December this year. Um, that's also not an easy decision to take, I bet. No, it's, it was absolutely not, not easy. Although in that time, the June issue, um, the June uh, holding the annual in June looked impossible. Yeah. And um, because in that period, June was, let's say, the moment we get out of this, which is now, as we can see, not the truth. And, and by that period, we thought we pushed it as far as we could in this certain year, because we want to hold a meeting in this year. Also, um, as Alexander says, because there are liabilities and there are yeah. uh, business, um, uh, the, there are contracts and there you have a business there to run as well. And also because we thought... Um, uh, in December, we are absolutely safe, um, far away from COVID, which is now probably more different than we envisioned in, let's say, three three months ago. So, but still, we think that December can actually be a good meeting because, as Alexander said, I agree with him because we, what we see is um, a separation. I think a lot of things can be done online, and what we also see, we have, we have reached wider the audiences via uh, virtual engagement. So we can see that we, at certain topics, people from all over the world are calling in much more easy than, and then of course a physical, a physical meeting, which is a good thing to see. But we also see a lot of people who are struggling with um, with virtual meetings and actually looking forward to have physical meetings again and do business. I will not say old-fashioned way, but let's just the way we used to do it. But so I think there will be a different future, and there will be a a different separation and, and, and of these, but, but we also see that there is still a need for uh, physical meetings in terms of just strolling around an exhibition and see what you can get out of this and just meeting people in, in person and just network in person and how it will look like we will see. But I, I think what we see now by, we try to get more, more than in, in, in normal years, we try to get out of our submitted technical papers and people how many people actually will come because this is for us of course the biggest question mark how many people will actually travel to the annual and we can see from from europe actually we see a bigger a big percentage is actually willing to come so yeah. we see a big a big uh, a big willingness in our members from europe especially to see that in december it would probably be okay to travel so we see a big engagement there to to travel to the annual yeah it's it's 
it, although it's quite different from we have a, we have a big community from China submitting papers to our conference and from the US, and this is for us very unclear. But for this moment, we see we see also, as Alexander said, we see also a relief that we can actually move into a uh, or that we can move into an era where we actually can meet physically if necessary, if we want to do business and talk to each other. Yeah. But also we can see that things in the future are different because we have this virtual yeah. engagement possibility. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree with that. So Edith, do you see on behalf of the AAPG, I mean, would you also see that blended future of, of still being able to connect and see each other live? And is there anything big that you've planned? Because I remember we were supposed to meet in the ICE, I think, in, uh, in, uh, in Madrid, weren't we? Yes, and like the EAPG, uh, EAG, we have um, uh, postponed or canceled most of those meetings. Um, we are, as the IGA is doing, holding our board meetings virtually, um, okay. which is actually working uh, so far quite well. Um, but I, I think what we will be looking to do is to both collaborate with other associations to maximize those opportunities for in-person meetings and also redesigning the virtual content so that it is specifically targeted at specific times. And as Alexander said so, so well, we have to create a new business model around virtual delivery of technical content. We have done that to some degree with our written technical content through our delivery systems of journal articles and um, uh, um, uh, virtual digital technical content online uh, in written format. We're now going to have to develop a business model for sharing our technical content virtually um, uh, in, uh, in, in, a, in a digital world. Uh, excellent. And it brings me, I mean, that collaborative spirit, I think that brings me to the next sort of topic I want to explore with the three of you, and that is the energy transition as a whole. Now, in my former life, I was of those two organizations, AAPG and the EAG, a very proud member. However, I turned sides and I joined the IGA. Um, but that's not entirely true because I'm still very much supportive and we're collaborating with both of the organizations, of course, uh, quite a bit and we're organizing events and workshops and we talk to each other and trying to maximize, you know, the value added to our both or all the three of our memberships. But I do think that the energy transition, and this is what I first want to hear from Marcel, I guess, from on behalf of the EAGE. Um, do members reach out to you more than ever when it comes down to new energy, alternative energy, phasing out that fossil fuel background and, and, and reaching out to that new energy space? Do you feel that within your membership? Yeah, yeah, we absolutely feel that. Not only be, not only the members actually, it's, it's members, but also companies who actually ask us to be more, um, um, to be more, uh, to diversify more in the topics. As I said, we are a multi multidisciplinary society, but we, we hear more and more the call for um, activities around energy transition, around getting greener, whatever you want to want to name it. And, and as a result of that, we, uh, we established a decarbonization energy transition community, which is really active. So it's, it's catching up quite a lot of, a lot of members. Everybody can become a member of that. So it's not, exclusive for EAG members, but everybody can engage in that. And we see a lot of um, movement there and we see a lot of activity there online. So that gives us already a signal that there is a lot going on. What we also see is that even, um, so we have um, uh, a near service community, a near service division, and, and a lot of topics there are more like crossovers and, and, and are very interested, found by the oil and gas people to just team up with the near service community in that sense, which was quite separated, let's say 15, 20 years ago, which is, is really more intertwined in this, in, in, at this moment more than ever because of the energy transition. And a result of that is actually the, um, the GET conference, which you know, yeah. and it's actually, um, uh, is, is, is Margaret Krieger from the uh, IGA is actually very active in that as well. Yeah. And, and we, um, 
and 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 there we see a, a nice crossover between um, uh, uh, let's say shallow topics and and oil and gas who is actually coming together for that energy transition but we try to the the the, the question we get from members and 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 and, and industry as well is more even 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 recently we we have new board members and actually these board members need to explain why they why they team up with EAG and actually actually one of the explanations from companies said we we want to give all the we want to give all the um, all the uh, all the support we can to this candidate as you all know it how this works in boards yeah. they said we want to give it because we see that EAG and we want the EAG to be more into the energy transition as an oil and gas company. So it's funny that even companies think more in the lines of uh, if you do more on energy transition, we can give support to future board members to support to programs. So it's really more triggered by um, by members and 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 companies as well um, than only by us. Yeah. But we of course see that we need to do it because of the future of the society. Yeah, for sure. You also you also feel that that's happening, and you can't sleep yourself in mind as a as an organization. I fully agree. So, Alex, I mean, we have to have this discussion as well on how to position geothermal in that new energy space. Is there anything that you think we should be doing? You know, after you have left the seat of the president, obviously. But is there anything that you would like to give to the IGA as a you know as a well thought vision for how we can really let's say shape that conversation with the hydrocarbon industry with geothermal and maybe that subservice position that we you know we position ourselves pretty good i think as geothermal but how can we become better at it i think for that you need to put geothermal into into the context of the overall energy transition and i think the interesting part i guess for our friends in the in the you know related to the oil and gas sector is that we found it we found it really difficult to connect to the renewable energy story given that it was all about wind and solar while at the same time representing something that is so tied to the oil and gas sector so that was always seen as a challenge in a sense of well how renewable are you as an industry in the first place given that you're doing exactly the same thing but deriving something different you know, versus kind of being a renewable energy technology that wants to kind of position itself away from oil and gas and sector while always finding that kind of connection to it as well. So that's been a big challenge, particularly in the, in the let's say, in the early days of, of the, the big renewable energy hype. Um, now we are all of a sudden in a different situation where, or maybe not that different because, I mean, we've, We've always grown in times when the oil and gas sector has faced challenges. You know, in the 80s with the oil crisis, that's when the big boom happened in geothermal. Then oil prices were, 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 were rising and geothermal faded out. During the financial crash, something similar happened. And now we're basically all of a sudden again in a situation where the oil sector is, is, is struggling and all of a sudden we see an interest from that part of the, the energy sector. So it's a, it's a very interesting part. And what, it's, what it shows us that is that I think nowhere else do we have this possibility of a technology transfer, which makes it actually very attractive to saying, okay, we are not reinventing the wheel. We're utilizing something that's already been developed. And how that transfer can look like will be interesting to see. And Again, I think, I mean, I've, and I've, I've, Marit and I have been talking a lot about this. It's not all just about the technology. It is about understanding the business model of tapping into a commodity, even though our commodity is not fluid. Well, it is, but utilized differently. Um, and in that sense, understanding how we plug the business model of the oil and gas sector to the geothermal sector and combine it with a utility-based energy business model. And I think that, that context of putting these different industrial models together will kind of be the challenge that we face as, not just as an industry, but as a, as a, as a, as a, as a world, as a, as a whole. Yeah. Because we see you know, BP and others of the oil sector uh, companies going into the wind sector, which is a complete different business model while at the same time, we providing that 
but in a way of allowing you to utilize that know-how and, and understanding. And, and that should make it very interesting. And what we, what we naturally as a geothermal sector are, are facing with we, how can we attract the oil and gas sector to invest, to engage? And we've had this discussion earlier today, but the challenge in that regard is, is that we need the money to attract the oil sector. But at the same time, we need the money of the oil and gas sector to come in to develop the projects that would buy the services of the oil sector. So it's like, it's, it's that challenge that we face. And, um, and I think in many ways, what we're looking too little into is, is the business model and the business models of renewable energy development and how that can look like. Yeah, thanks. He, and Edith, um, I, I know we have talked about this, but uh, the energy transition as a, for you personally, but also the group that you represent uh, on behalf of the AAPG is of course, crucial it's crucial for what it is that you want to achieve inspire also your 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 members to um to become forward thinking and to join that conversation so on behalf of the aapg the energy transition is that is that really live is that it, are you are you changing your name i always get that question eh? is the american association of petroleum the other going to change that name? are you changing your name do you think <laughs> Edith, are you still here? Did we lose Edith? Okay. We'll park Edith for a sec. Maybe you come back because I can't hear you, Edith. I am back. I apologize. Yes. I had a, an issue with my phone. No um, let me know if you um, if you have trouble with this audio. But um, uh, Merit, um, your question is so timely. And having spent the last year leading that division of the AAPG, which embraces the energy transition and opens our um, our portfolio beyond oil and gas, um, I can tell you that we are growing rapidly in membership, as particularly our younger members embrace the energy transition and the change that it brings. Um, what I will say about um, for after 30 years in the oil and gas business and the last five years looking at all renewables, including geothermal, wind, solar, the utility business model that Alex so beautifully um, described the need for, what I can see is a fundamental change in the application of earth sciences to the energy landscape. And what I mean by this is instead of focusing on extraction, whether it be lithium, oil and gas, geothermal energy, we must become more focused on optimization and sustainability, creating sustainable supply chains for energy. Now, whether that means producing the lowest carbon barrel, um, engaging in carbon capture to influence the negative side of the equation, as well as the positive addition of carbon to the atmosphere, whether that means utilizing old oil field infrastructure so that we don't waste heat, geothermal heat that we're currently wasting, um, whether it means um, uh, looking at um, new uh, avenues for lithium extraction that use much less water, like Breakthrough Energy Ventures lilac process, all of these processes, they may be a little more surface focused than subsurface focused, but understanding industrial mineral processing and the impact of the geology that we understand and know, the earth modeling from the subsurface to the surface to the material scale, um, we're going to have to, all of our geoscientists and all of our associations are going to have to focus on some part of that sustainable supply chain. So I see the AAPG as being a wonderful repository for all of that, both technology, the big drill bit um, that, that we certainly have developed around, um, but also that earth science expertise in uh, two-phase fluid flow and porous media, in subsurface modeling, um, in, uh, in, in CO2 um, uh, sequestration. So yeah, I think 
everyone is going to have to change how they think about their place in a sustainable energy supply chain. Excellent, excellent. I'm, I'm, I'm calling up now to the ones who are joining us online. If you have any questions that you want to ask specifically to those three representatives of the organizations, you can do so by using the chat and so you type your question and I will be moderating that. In the meantime, I would like to go to the final sort of um, theme that I wanted to well end this conversation uh, with, and that is about aligning our associations. And it's not because I want to merge all of us. <laughs> that goes beyond the conversation. Now, what I mean with that is that I, we face similar issues. We want to inspire young people. We are facing climate change and hence an increasing interest in the energy transition as a whole. IGA representing specifically geothermal, EAGE getting into geothermal because members are asking for it, corporates are asking for the energy transition, APG, you're doing, we're doing the same things with the APG when it comes down to organizing specific events. Yet, and I can honestly say this because I am from the two worlds now, eh? I used to work in hydrocarbon, I am now in geothermal. I find it difficult sometimes to bridge those two communities. It is not easy. It is something that you really have to push and you really have to pull that bridge between the two communities. So one of the areas that I'm quite keen to explore with, you know, high level people such as yourself, with whom it is, by the way, very easy to discuss that we should synergize, but it is about getting the alignment across our organizations and specifically across our membership. So Alex, I'm going to start with you because I know you have plentiful ideas on this and we have been talking about this quite a bit. But could you share your, let's say, observations on how we can bridge and how we can become more active as a bigger community and align that associations, let's say, thought process when it comes down to shaping also the conversation for political leadership because that's very needed as well. I guess, I guess the, the, uh, the, the, main, the main challenge that we see in a lot of the context of associations is that we have varying interests of our members uh, and, uh, and, and organizations and regional, et cetera, et cetera. So let's say there's, there's, there's always a certain perceived overlap and, uh, and, uh, and a sense of competitiveness. Uh, and I think we need to overcome that to say, where, where, where do we actually provide value? Uh, and, and, and figuring out a way to kind of support each other because we are clearly providing a value and how that can look like depends on the exact nature of our business. Uh, given the IGA, we, we are representing a wide variety of, uh, of, of elements, you know, from, from, from the subsurface uh, engineering to, to, to turbines, infrastructure, uh, marketing people, lawyers, what, what, whatever. And while kind of, I guess, the colleagues of, of ours in the in the oil and gas sector probably more focus on the subservice and I might do you not might do you not just it but 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 in that context I guess that's where we also focus on 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 the overall arching element and it's it's really figuring out a way to to work together and, and I guess is how can we engage our members and our stakeholders to to push renewable energy development how that can look like is a different different question. But I found it particularly interesting when, when, when I took over the presidency of the IJ to understand the business model of running an association, quite interesting, given that I've also been an executive director of one. But, but it's really understanding how the business model of these associations works in your industry and what can we learn from that for the things that we do. So I found it extremely interesting to kind of look at the different business models and how this works for the associations, but also, and that's kind of where I kind of take a more helicopter view perspective, how can we sell business models to our members? So understanding how a business model of an oil service company works, what can we learn from that towards creating a similar structure in our industry and for members? Uh, and this is the part where like I see this entrepreneurial opportunities in a sense of understanding how, how we can be, become more successful. Yeah, great. Thank you. And Marcel, 
EAGE, you said you are active in so many countries, and I know that because I've been speaking to quite a few of your uh, outreach uh, areas as well, ranging from Middle East to, to, to Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, you just discussed that. Um, I, but, you know, every country is different when it comes down to the energy transition as a whole and where they are at. But how do you see that we can shape that conversation also across your EAGE, but also across, let's say, that wider energy space? Yeah, first of all, we have a lot of contact um, on several levels in the association. If you talk about association, we, you have board levels, community levels, committee levels, um, office levels even. We are on office level as well, and membership levels. And um, uh, we try in all levels to actually um, have this com communication with other societies. We know there are a lot of people also a member of the APG, SCG, uh, SPE, IJ, um, Dean GK, we have, in fact, we have in November in 2018, we had a, we had a conference joined as in a deep geothermal energy. And I think we need to continue those, um, those uh, corporations. And, and what I see more and more happening is it's not only on, on a board level, or, or it's not only on, the, on, the, on, the, on an office level where we actually try to um, ally calendars, which we do, you know, we try to ally calendars and try to see where we do not overlap because overlap is, is is losing for every society in that sense and but i also see a lot of companies um, who actually um, try to trigger us to communicate more and to try to cooperate more with other societies because they need to make a choice where they send their people you know they need to go through the calendar and actually send people to one two three four uh, uh, events that year and they want to only pay for a number of events and so they want to cooperate as more as well so they force us to cooperate more as well and of course we want to support you know we're working more and more into communities as i said the decarbonization community is one of them and there are more and more and geothermal is one of them as well so we want to work more in these communities and these communities bring in new members young members as well a lot of young members who see the crossover um, uh, benefit in the AG but also a member of the IGA or the APG or the SP or whatever. And, 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 and there you can see from the bottom up more initiatives where they actually can see the, uh, the overlap in, 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 in topics and, 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 and complement complementary uh, benefits of, 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 the, of the difficult, the di different, um, the different elements and the different topics in those. Uh, so I think, I guess, it's, it's important for members to explore and young people to explore what they can get out of the IGA in overlap with EG and APG. You know, every society offers, yeah, in, in their core area. But since we now need all, we need, all need to move into this sort of more blended societies and more into this energy transition, you can get energy transition in all sort of flavors from the IGA, from the EG, from the APG. And I think it's up to the members to sort of benefit from that, um, from that development. Yeah, yeah. Ah, great, great, great. Here in Edith, yeah, it's, it's as expected. I come now to you. <laughs> we make the rounds as always. But uh, Edith, APG, again, I mean, uh, I, I know you personally uh, very well over the past year when we met and, uh, and you're, you're constantly making the case for collaboration. And I, and I, and I know you are, you are such a person, but I also feel that by doing things together, uh, we, we, we were engaged in, uh, in that energy transition forum, uh, with APG, mm -hmm. the IGA is organizing these crossover geothermal workshops as well, um, in what well, is predominantly in Europe. But if you look at the APG and, 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 and how can we strengthen that entire message that we want to get out of APG, but connected that to that, you know, all the associations out there? Yeah, I think it's, it's both unique to AAPG, but also um, common among our organizations that in the last 10 years, um, uh, we have really tried to be all things to all people. We broaden our scope, we, we collaborate with each other, which is wonderful, but um, I work with a group of young energy geoscientists and engineers who are looking for um, uh, new opportunities in the energy transition. And what they tell me is that 
Um, it appears from the outside as though each organization wants to sort of um, uh, spread itself over the energy landscape and provide a wide, wide range of services. And I think what we are looking at um, in the AAPG is how can we strengthen our core offerings, things that only we can offer? How can we make sure that anyone who wants to understand um, fractured reservoirs or how fluids move in basins is going to go to the AAPG bulletin for that information and add value to our organization by, by using that resource? Um, and, and how can our meetings be arranged so that they are specifically focused on, on core technical offerings that, that only we can provide? But on the other hand, what we need to do is collaborate and combine those meetings when there are drilling technologies that are important for both um, uh, SPE, AAPG, EHEE, um, IGA. How do we um, pull those meetings together so that we only have to go to one and we co-sponsor one? As we look to our young professionals and networking and collaboration, professional development, um, what they need is not to see six different training courses offered by six different organizations, but one training course where they can go and meet with their colleagues in all the different uh, participating organizations. So I think what we're working toward at APG and what I personally think is a fruitful approach in this era is to dig in deep to the things that are unique to our organizations and make those incredibly special and valuable um, so that they attract participants and members, but stop competing with each other on the collaborative events and the training events and begin to offer a more concise landscape of professional um, development to particularly to our younger members so that we have less impact on their time and finances and, and sort of more bang for the buck. Right, right. There were a few questions in the chat, but they have already been answered by our fantastic <laughs> dynamic, <laughs> dynamic uh, people uh, in, the, in the panel. Um, but I did get a few questions prior to the session, and one of them I found really interesting because I, I have to admit, I did not think of this. Um, when it comes down, for instance, to taking a position around climate change, quite a few of the associations have either undesigned a matter of, you know, Attend or attend or sign a declaration uh, that they want to seek to you know, comply with the Paris Agreement and will do everything they can in terms of you know, their membership, in terms of education, and creating awareness of disability, and whatever. Um, so the question was are these associations, when they're dealing with the energy transition on behalf of their membership, willing to create a letter of intent when it comes down to voicing out the need for the service as an enabler of the energy transition as a whole? Meaning that uh, I'm willing as associations to come together and create a statement on how important the service is when it comes down to the energy transition and tackling climate change. I'm going to start with you. I had like part of part of your answer I was was breaking breaking up in between. But to understand this, I guess, and please correct me if I get this wrong. But <clears throat> the understanding, I guess, is to understand where we create value to the topics of discussed as part of the energy transition. Correct? Yeah. Sorry, my sound was breaking up. I just, I, I, I is it better now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Okay, so the question is, the question is, um, certain associations have signed up to stand, to take a position around climate change. For instance, we will do everything we can to decarbonize and this and that and the other. The question is, are we as associations prepared to sign a declaration that we will do everything we can to take a position in the, let's say, the subservice, uh, that the subservice is needed for, uh, a just transition, the energy transition as a whole, tackling climate change, meaning that a lot of people probably think that geologists, earth sciences are left behind when it comes down to the discussions in the energy transition. That's where I think the question. Yeah. Comes. yeah. 
I mean, extremely valid. I mean, we've had the experience that we have is that actually from time to time, we have to stand up for the subsurface know-how of our friends in the oil and gas sector uh, in the renewable energy discussions. I mean, we are part of, let's say, the uh, different renewable energy groups within, for example, the International Renewable Energy Agency. And, and they're basically, there's a, there's a drive basically demonizing the oil and gas sector completely. And that is something that, well, we might share at least part of it, saying that part of, let's say, the oil and gas sector is not living up to the renewable energy standards that we would like to see in the future. But this has nothing to do with the know-how that we need as part of geothermal and its value proposition. We need that experience know-how and the services that are in existence of the oil and gas sector. So we will not be able to exist as an industry if we don't tap into that know-how of the earth science. Um, so, so yeah, so we, we've actually stood up from time to time to saying, hey, listen, I mean, it is not that black and white. Um, and so in a sense of we as, as the International Geothermal Association could actually be the bridge for you and for you members into the renewable energy sector. Because we, we make this case again and again, where we say, hey, listen, I mean, we are tapping, we are tapping a natural resource, but we do that sustainably by you know, managing the resource in reservoir management and so on. And at the same time, you know, deriving lithium, which is now part of the geothermal story, um, taps into, in, in, into something that, that, that you are representing as well. So, we could, as a geothermal kind of organization, bridging that, that, you know, bridging that for you. Uh, and it's a question, yeah, and I would definitely say is that we can, we should maybe develop a statement. It's like, you know, in order for the energy transition, earth sciences are needed. And to what extent that is, the, that is, the, that is then the question. But, but yeah, I mean, we need, we need the earth sciences. We need the geologists, we need, we need all of that experience. Um, and uh, I'm definitely forgetting a few here, but that's, but that's crucial. So, and I guess we need to figure out a way to kind of play that together. Um, and I mean, if I can support this in one way or another, I mean, yeah, absolutely, I'm, I'm up for it. Um, because yeah, we need to do that. That doesn't mean that we support certain elements of the oil and gas sector that we think is maybe not, you know, future proof but we need that experience. So to demonizing the oil and gas sector is not something that we should nor have been doing. Yeah, very good, very good. Um, another question that uh, people wrote to me prior to this, this is not in the chat, this, this was written to me prior to the conversation is uh, about um, the, the gender, uh, because the IGA for the first time in its history will uh, see uh, a majority female board which is quite exciting to see that in 2020 uh, happening. So um, maybe Marcel, on behalf of the EAGE, how gender sensitive is the EAGE in this, uh, in this energy transition uh, space? Well, what, what we try to do, we try to push hard for any diversification. So it's not only in topics, but it's also in, uh, in gender diverse or, 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 um, or, or geographical diverse, actually being ge geographical diverse um, in, in committees, so there was um, long discussions already for years actually to to become more diverse in terms of um, in terms of geographical, but also in gender. So we try to uh, push more and more for um, for gender diversity in in in, uh, in communities and in committees and in, in board uh, offices. Um, quite gender diverse already, and um, and and actually I must say because we 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 are quite lucky that we are n we are um, uh, still oil and gassy, you know, but, but our, our, our membership is actually really young compared to some other societies. So we, we're doing actually, we have really a lot of, and it, 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 the diversity is also noticeable in, in several different regions. So in every region is different, different. So we see more gender diversity in, in some regions and, and less in other regions, but all in all, we have a young community with a lot of gender diversity and and we always try to promote it, and it's big. It's it's on top of the agenda. And I must say, the women in geoscience um, community is pushing hard and hard for um, activity around this. So we we try to do whatever we can, and and as other diversity, it's 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 high on our agenda. Yeah, yeah, 
great, great answer, yes. I, with an eye on the time, I'm going to ask uh, a last question. And I, it is really interesting because either you are responding to certain questions in the chat as well, because this is, this is really great. No, this is really great because there is someone, I think it's Helen, who said that there is a GeoSoc in London running a Geosciences for the Future event. And um, yes, because yeah, in the UK, I noticed that there is a decline in, in terms of young geologists, um, well, even no geologists, you know I mean, not starting their geology degree, which is really, which, which is really sad to see, obviously. But maybe Edith, for you, the last question is really about, um, let's say the future proofing of the organization and not to re-ask the question again, will you change the name of the AAPG? But I do think, that, <laughs> I get that a lot. Eh? I don't know why it is, I don't know why, but uh, no, but I think I, uh, the question is really coming from how to attract young members, how to attract and diversify the membership. Uh, everybody seems to be interested in that energy transition. That's, that's, that gives purpose, we all understand. But how do you inspire your people to become a member? That's different. So what's your final yeah. thoughts on that? Well, inspiring membership in any professional organization for me means that one has to focus on the mission. Um, and in part because if, if I speak specifically to the AAPG at this point, because we have for the last decade been struggling with identity as climate change becomes more and more a fact of life, as climate mitigation becomes more and more the responsibility and job of, of geoscientists and energy geoscientists in particular, and as young people in particular are looking for um, uh, a future-proofed organization, an organization that is embracing the change that comes with the energy transition, we have to look very hard in the AAPG at our divided souls. You know, we represent an industry that um, has um, a, a very um, rich history of producing CO2. And so we have to struggle with um, both our um, members who work for major multinational organizations who are diversifying and embracing opportunities in climate change. Um, we also, and in the energy transition, but we also um, feel an obligation to serve our members who are rooted in um, oil and gas business that does not have the opportunity to embrace those changes. So we have this sort of extra layer of um, definition that we are working on in our mission, but it is very much a work in progress and we take steps forward and we take steps back. So um, my pitch to young earth scientists who want to, who are looking for a professional organization that involves their desire to stay involved with exploration and production of hydrocarbons in a sustainable manner is join AAPG and work from within to make change and recognize that that's not going to be an easy road, that we are kind of, you know, the, 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 the focus, the center of where this major 180 degree turn is happening. So, it's not always pretty. It's not always easy. We don't always have leaders who are looking forward instead of looking back. But all we can do to make that happen is to become those leaders. So um, that's the pitch I make for those young people who are looking for a professional organization. From what we can do internally and what we have tried to do this year as the Energy Minerals Division of the AAPG, is focus on providing those core services, science and professional development. If you can offer that for good value, then members will come. Fantastic. 
I am taking a note of the time and it is, it is, it is just so sad because we could do this uh, probably for another uh, half an hour. But um, first of all, I want to thank the three of you for your time and your commitment. And as I said before, not just for this hour conversation, but really for all your energy and your commitment towards running an organization like Marcel or being the president of the organization such as Alexander and, uh, and Edith. Um, it was a pleasure. I think we have seen strong engagement from the people who attended. We will be able to, you know, they will be able to see you and scout you and find you on LinkedIn and, and engage with you. I am sure we'll be there to answer all the remaining uh, questions. Um, for me, it's very good to mention uh, that with all the associations, so with the EAG, the GET 2020, we're working together to get that done. We're doing a few sessions at your annual in December in Amsterdam, my hometown. So I will be there, you know, whatever happens, I shall be there. Um, but also you're coming to the WGC 2020 in Iceland in May. Uh, and Edith with the APG, we're having that crossover you know, future proofing workshops that we're trying to get together every year. So in that sense, aligning the associations on all our behalf. I think we are doing that. And I and I really commend all of you for putting all your hard work to that. I thank the members uh, from all of our organizations that they keep on asking us to do that and to set those initiatives because people asking for it, it means that there is a market for it. Um, and, uh, and with that, I want to say a thank you for the audience uh, who stuck with us, uh, who raised quite a few questions who were already answered. So I thank you again for doing that, uh, my dear panel. And with that, I'm just going to say bye bye. Have a great evening. Have a great day and uh, speak soon and stay engaged. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much bye. for having us. Bye, Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you very much.